Hi, um, I'm Dr. Mark Perlow and I'm here with Erica Volk and we are going to be discussing PCOS and uh, just a broad range of topics and we hope that you're going to submit questions for us and we'll try to review those questions and get to them uh, during our discussion today. So uh, I wanted to welcome you, Erica, and thank oh, you thank for you. Uh, stopping in. Well, thank you for having me. It's so nice to um, get to hang out with you a little bit and to hang out with the people watching on Facebook Live. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Erica Volk. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach. I blog at ericavolkfitness.com. And I call myself the PCOS personal trainer because I, too, have PCOS. And I've learned to manage my symptoms and really just have a healthy, vital, exciting, great life through um, using fitness as, as a way to uh, make my PCOS feel like a very small part of my life. So the other thing, uh, we have uh, Ashley Levinson, who's PCOS girl online. And Ashley has been incredibly active throughout the PCOS world. I think we probably got to know each other. It may actually be 20 years ago now that uh, we first wor worked together on uh, various uh, conferences and educational seminars. Um, Ashley has been working about uh, creating spaces for women to get together and talk about PCOS. And uh, she's going to be answering some of the questions here and Rebecca Heary is just uh, joining us, and Rebecca will be taking your questions and uh, sharing them with us to uh, cover in our discussion. So uh, one of the things that I find uh, exciting here is that uh, you don't just have a Georgia or a United States uh, <laughs> a reference point on PCOS. You've been living with PCOS, dealing with it, but ex also experiencing it around the world. <laughs> uh, every time I looked at your site, you were living someplace different, and all of those places were places that I wanted to visit and uh, <laughs> get a chance to see. But what have you learned from your travels, and how has that um, helped you with PCOS and dealing with it and understanding? Wow, that's a really good question. I don't know if I've ever thought about that. So I would actually say that I've lived and had food and enjoyed the, the cultures of many different countries, from European to Asian to Indian food. And I have actually, when I, I make it a point when I live in a different country, to really eat their foods. And what I have found is that no matter where you are in the world, it is possible to eat a PCOS-friendly diet. So never think that if you see just a, a PCOS recipe book online and you don't have access to those types of foods, don't become beside yourself. It's possible with there's plenty of fresh fruits, vegetables, and lean protein everywhere. So I would say that for the diet side, and I would also add to since I travel so much, I don't have a car, and just the um, commuting on foot every day, just that little bit of extra added activity, whether it's 20 or 15 minutes, makes a huge difference in my mood and makes it remarkably easy to uh, just maintain your weight without a lot of thought. Well, it's interesting when you mentioned about the car, um, because in I love Indian food. <laughs> and, I mean, I'm, I just can't help it, but you have naan, the wonderful breads. You have uh, various things made with potatoes and sweets, and then there's rice, all of which is not really the best thing for uh, managing a PCOS diet. Right. It seems to work okay in India for a lot of Indians, although they're becoming increasingly aware of PCOS. But when those uh, Indian women and their husbands get to the United States, where we spend more time watching TV and sitting in cars, the diet really can be toxic. So it's not just how that diet affects a local population, but in a different environment, how that diet may affect you and how you may have to adjust. I think you make a really good point, and I can say definitely that I've been seeing an increase of emails with questions about PCOS from that area of the world, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the thing is, is that I think it's important to understand with lifestyle and diet and being healthy, you can't take one thing in isolation. You have to look at the big picture. 
And um, so just thinking that you have this one special diet or this one supplement is going to solve all your problems, uh, it would be nice, but it's really just about looking at your life as a whole. Angela Gracia, I think, is uh, on with us here, and she has uh, a wonderful cookbook, the PCOS Nutrition Center um, cookbook, and has a lot of good uh, recipes that I've tried and had a lot of fun uh, making. But one of the things that uh, Angela spoke about at the conference, or one of the conferences I heard her speak, was really about changing the relationship with food. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned earlier when we were talking about how um, one of your patients was telling you how she zips home uh, in the morning and maybe going through fast food at McDonald's or someplace to grab something to eat and then sitting in front of the TV later on. But it's really about changing the relationship. And um, I had been doing metformin diet and exercise for quite some time, but I took off another 10 pounds just by getting involved with Blue Apron <laughs> and getting more involved in the process of preparing the food. When I went beyond that and started going to the farmer's market and meeting the people it, you know, who were growing the food and providing, raising the cattle that uh, we were partaking of, um, it really changed how I thought about food and it was more about nourishment and about the process of creating, eating, sharing than it was about, I've got to put something in my stomach. So I wanted to thank Angela um, for that kind of guidance and tip that really helped me look at things from a new, uh, a new viewpoint. Yeah, and Angela, if you're watching, your cookbook has made it to about 24 different countries now with me in my suitcase. It's an awesome book if you haven't had the chance to pick it up. It's worth getting. Well, that's great. <laughs> um, we had the opportunity recently to speak in Nashville um, in front of a, a group of uh, nutritionists from around the country and uh, share this information and it was exciting there was a lot of interest in the uh, uh, event was well attended so that was cool we were also talking earlier about um, inositols and everybody hears about metformin i see a lot of patients who have been to their doc and the doc finally figures out that yeah i think you do have pcos or they do an insulin and say you don't have PCOS incorrectly because their sugars are normal. Right. That's one of the things that uh, is upsetting. But um, the oftentimes we'll get if they're put on this, we see people get put on the extended release, which is not as effective, or given a single 500 milligram tablet because they've heard somewhere that metformin might be good. Um, mm. It's just if you're going to do that, you want to know what the dose is and evaluate because some people need more than 500 twice a day or 850 or 1,000 twice a day. Or uh, we find that about 30% will be um, ha demonstrate impaired glucose tolerance and about 7% will actually have diabetes mm -hmm. when we test them. So it's important that you not only work with your nutritionist and learn about exercise and and um, the like and kind of take a comprehensive approach but you want to make sure that uh, diabetes is not something because there can be long-term health ramifications of not getting a proper evaluation so uh, I want to get back to you here and ask you a question when um, I went to my doc he's giving me all the reports lab tests that he drew on me and when I'm listening to him, it sounded just like I had PCOS. Mm. Um, I didn't have the high testosterone <laughs> <laughs> to go with it, and I certainly hadn't had any periods, but the, it sounded like PCOS. PCOS. Yeah. And he said, you know, you've got to get out there and exercise. What advice do you give, would you give to someone like me who for 30 years um, the remote control for the TV set was uh, thumb aerobics mm -hmm. was about the best thing that I was doing. Okay, that's a good question. So I have a question for you. When you decided yeah. to become a doctor, did you walk into a hospital a couple days later and were you able to treat people? No, not really. Not really. No, it took a while. In um, fact, well, I won't, I won't go over the, a long the first while. experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it did. Many years. 
Well, I think for some reason that people get this idea in their head that they should be able to walk into a gym and just know what they're doing. And so we get discouraged and frustrated when you walk in and you get that seizing feeling that you don't understand how to use a weightlifting machine and you don't feel comfortable with dumbbells. And what I say, the first thing is, is to get into your head this growth mindset that I'm about to learn a skill, the skill of working out. And it's going to take time, just like it took time for me to learn my profession. It took time for me to learn how to read. It took time for me to learn how to walk a long, long time ago. And to give yourself a lot of compassion and patience and not to be so hard on yourself. So that would be my first thing. Mm -hmm. Second thing, going into the nitty gritty of what actually works and doesn't work with exercise is that it's easy to just hop on a cardio machine and watch the news and just put in your time and leave the gym. But it's really worthwhile to start strength training because it's going to raise your metabolic rate as you grow more muscle. And I know as women with PCOS, we think we don't want to get bigger. We're trying to lose weight, and that's kind of scary. But maybe you could talk about, like, the metabolic factors that go into growing muscle in your body. Okay, so when uh, my doctor said, you got to start exercising, I figured I needed an expert. So I went and asked Dr. Google about <laughs> what type of exercise I should do and um, how I should go about this process. What did I need to do? Pilates, yoga, aerobics that, you know, and um, I visited LA Fitness and, or LA Fatness as we started calling it <laughs> after a while, and you had the guys who lived in the gym and probably never left, you know, every month they went out and got a change of clothes, gym clothes, I think. Um, but I, I went out and I came across this book, Body by Science, by two physicians, uh, J.P. Little, who is in Montreal, and Doug McGuff, uh, who actually is in Seneca, South Carolina, not far from us here in Atlanta. And they did some studies looking at dividing a large group of people uh, into two groups. One group did an hour to an hour and a half of aerobics every day, the other group did 45 minutes of strength training, and it was vigorous strength training. And uh, they looked at it. The, the people who did the aerobics patted themselves on the back and said, we're burning 450 calories oh, a day, yeah. <laughs> and, and you guys are sitting there on the couch. Well, it turns out that um, you, you have about 15 minutes of quick energy in the muscle. After that, you start breaking down muscle and you're going to lose muscle mass, and each pound of muscle burns 75 calories a day. So if you're doing an hour to an hour and a half, and you lose a pound of muscle a week, that would be, after about six or seven weeks, that's about 450 calories a day that your body doesn't need. So either you're going to adjust your diet and cut your diet because you're losing muscle, or... Um, you know, you just won't lose weight. You, your body needs 450 calories a day less. You're burning that in your exercise, so you're not making any progress. Because you have less muscle, your body can't clear the sugar from the bloodstream, and as a result, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be turning to cholesterol and fat, and your insulin levels go up, your cholesterol goes up. So that's problematic. The other group did the strength training, and there are some tips with that. You don't want to work the same muscle group more than once a week to allow it to heal and to grow muscle. You want to take it to muscle failure, um, which means that you're sitting there and you're, you can't do anything more mm -hmm. with that. And I usually do about three sets. Um, and uh, that will help uh, build muscle, which is going to help take the weight off. Now. The interesting thing, this is National Infertility Awareness Week, so I think it's important to recognize that uh, the best way to focus on infertility is to focus on the metabolic abnormalities that are associated with um, PCOS. If you are, um, as that group that was sitting on the couch one day a week, they were burning 450 calories a day because they gained muscle mass, Mm -hmm. So they were burning the same number of calories as the people who were working out, but they got to do it on the couch. Um, so strength training is important. I recommend 
generally the people do 15 to 20 minutes, two or three times a week of aerobics. And that's not the kind where you're sitting there talking on your phone. Phone. <laughs> on, on the bike. Or, or, reading, yeah, or reading the newspaper. Catching up on email. Yeah, exactly. We've seen you at the gym. We know yeah. who you are. <laughs> that doesn't count. No, it doesn't. It's the one where you're getting to 75 to 80% of maximum heart rate. You're starting to break a sweat. If someone called you on the phone, you would look at it and hit the uh, not now, not reject now. button. Yeah. Um, that kind of exercise is the things that's going to work. And then I personally like machines, but whether you enjoy free weights or machines, that's fine. But that's going to help you set up this program for long-term weight loss. And if you're putting on 7 to 10 pounds of muscle over the course of a couple of months, it's your gonna weight is going to continue to go down. And when you uh, combine that uh, exercise with making the dietary changes, and insulin sensitizers such as um, uh, myo-inositol, inositol and metformin, you'll find that uh, it's not unusual for the periods to uh, restore and fertility to come back on its own. That's right, mine did, and a lot of my clients do. I think, so what you're saying kind of is it's really appealing to look at that dial on the cardio machine and see those calories tick off and feel like you're really doing something. Yeah. But kind of the purpose of exercise is actually to use it as a tool to change your metabolism, to change the metabolic features of PCOS by building that muscle, which causes your body to need more fuel and to burn more fuel and to use sugar better, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I um, often show, when I'm talking about PCOS, a video that shows a subway station in China where people are coming down the platform, they get down there and there's a big crowd waiting for the train and the train pulls in and it's filled with fat and glycogen or people, I'm not sure which. Um, the doors open and no one gets off so they start pushing more and more people into this and it reminds me of the... Uh, uh, what's going on in, in your muscles and PCOS yes. and by building putting more cars on the train we can clear more um, more cars on the train we can clear more carbs um, by doing the aerobics intense aerobics for short periods of time we're gonna make some room by the door so people can get in and then spread your um, food or meals out over um, a wider period of time so that the carbs are spread throughout the day and having the right types of carbs. Um, I remember in med school training, it was, you know, don't eat fats, mm, and yeah. then we switched to don't eat carbs, and then all fats were bad, and now it's, we have to understand that some fats are actually very good, and they help you fulfill hunger and diet, uh, dietary needs. And again, by doing this, the body knows what to do, and for most of the people dealing with PCOS, if that's the only problem keeping you from getting pregnant, then let the body do what it does normally and you'll get the best, um, best results. And also just to speak to you know, exercise and especially strength training from a non-medical perspective, it, it's, strength training in general is a more time efficient way to get fit. You, you tend to spend less time, so that's a bonus because the most common thing I hear is, I have trouble getting to the gym because of time. And I'll also say this, as a woman who's actually lived through this PCS journey and is still living through it, strength training is empowering. And when you feel like you've lost control, a good way to, to get your sense of self back is to get into the gym and see how physically strong you are. It's a, definitely a confidence booster if you're willing, willing to just start learning. And in the end, I find most women really enjoy the psychological benefits of that. Well, for a while, my why uh, where I go had the, all the machines were hooked up to the internet and it kept track so I could look and say oh my god I've lifted a million pounds so <laughs> far this year and my wife uh, looked at me and said so, so could you lift that thing with the laundry in it <laughs> and get deal with that laundry um, the other thing you you had said and I think is interesting is people have the uh, unfortunate misconception that cardio exercise is really strengthening and protecting the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think while it increases endurance, it's really the strength training and building muscle that's cardio protective. I mean, yes, that was a big surprise that we kind of came across recently mm -hmm. in like medical research world. It was interesting. 
to see that happen because for so long, I remember when I was growing up in gym class, it was all about the cardio, mm -hmm. and then we made this switch. So that's just another added benefit to the strength training, which is also important for women with PCOS because we're uh, at a little bit of higher risk for uh, heart disease. Uh, one of the toughest things for people is really negotiating the PCOS landscape. You get a diagnosis of PCOS, you go out, you find something, um, you take part maybe in one of the uh, online things. We have a number of videos on our uh, PCOS YouTube channel. Um, you go to a PCOS challenge event and, um, and you find out that the people who are advising you maybe don't know. <laughs> how, how does a person put together a plan that really will help them manage their PCOS? You know, I think the first thing to do is be careful how much information you're consuming and where you're getting it from. If you've just gotten a diagnosis, I see a lot of women go on what I call Google binges, where they just get way too much information, and then you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do this all. I still have to have a job. I'm never going to be able to manage my PCOS, and I just, you feel brokenhearted. So I think it's good to take one step, one small step that you feel about 90% confident that you can do right away, whether it, for me, it was getting into the gym because I was already uh, really just into the gym. And I think that's a great place to start if you're not sure where to start is to start with weightlifting. But it may be for you, it's just eating more vegetables and backing off of those refined carbohydrates. But start with one small step and build up. And then also, you, you want to gather a team around you of people that you can um, trust and that can support you. And that's going to be a physician. Maybe it's going to be a personal trainer. Uh, maybe it's going to be an online coach. And um, make sure that you're getting good information and also good social support from people that uh, care about your long-term success and they're not just trying to sell you a product. So uh, we have a question here that I think is right down your uh, avenue oh. and that is what, what are good exercises to do at home and I think that's really important because we've been talking a lot about going to the gym but that may not be the only way to get fit and deal with your PCOS. So. Let yeah. Me, yeah. <laughs> That's almost like a segue. You didn't have feed that question in, did you? Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I have been working out at home for three years. So it's totally possible to be fit, strong, and healthy at home. And you don't have to invest in a lot of equipment. So uh, you can start with body weight exercise, simple things like doing lunges, squats, a modified push-up until you can do them straight from the ground. Those are all good options. And um, what I have available on my site is a monthly workout, video workout program. So if you sign up for my program, you'll have access to videos that you can work out at home with me um, on your computer streaming live. So that's pretty cool. You can, and uh, my programs, we use both dumbbells, body weight for cardio, and also a neat piece of equipment called a suspension trainer. And you can set that up at home in your doorway and it allows you to use your own body weight as resistance. So for about $50, you could have all the strength training equipment you need at home. Um, so That's a little cheaper than a gym. It's a little cheaper than a gym, and if you, uh, if you have a family at home you have to take care of, or maybe you don't live near a gym. I've had some clients that they would have to drive an hour just to get to a gym, and that's an awful lot. So there are some alternatives out there. Those are good ones to start with. If you head over to my website, there's all kinds of free downloadable workouts in PDF form to get you started. Great. And uh, Ashley uh, suggested uh, visiting PCOSchallenge.org, that they have a lot of resources on there. And then we have some information. The YouTube channel is bitly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash in capital letters, GRS underscore PCOS, and that will um, give you 30 different videos, one for each day of uh, PCOS Awareness Month. The website, again, for PCOS Challenge is PCOSChallenge.org, uh, and that uh, will provide you a lot of resources, again, um, on... Um, uh, here's someone asking about uh, gastric sleeve surgery and how does that affect PCOS. Well, the gastric banding surgery I strongly recommend against. Uh, we have at least 50% of people 
who opt for that surgery end up asking it for uh, to be undone. That works by causing you pain when you eat, and that's not addressing things. Mm -hmm. I think the most physiologic surgery is the um, laparoscopic gastric bypass. Oftentimes that's now combined with the sleeve procedure. But what the uh, bypass is doing is hooking the stomach up um, a, a certain distance away from where it normally is. And the environment with the high sugar and the carbs and the fat that gets deposited in the hormone producing cells in the wall of the bowel really uh, screw up all the chemical messages that are supposed to be happening after you eat. Turns out when you just move the stomach down a little bit lower that um, the hormone messages are restored and people will lose weight and of those who are diabetic, um, roughly 95 to 98% can be cured by a laparoscopic bypass. Now, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody until they've actually tried losing weight um, first with a diet and exercise and insulin sensitizers, but it is something that you may wish to consider um, further on down the road. Um, it does take about a year or so to get nutritionally back to normal. You want to make sure that the person doing this is quite experienced. A lot of physicians now are doing robotic uh, surgery, which can lower the risk of the surgery um, even more. But the important thing is to know that um, you don't want to really look at bariatric surgery until the risks of not doing the surgery turn out to be much greater than the risks of actually doing it. And uh, most hospitals, most physicians uh, who do bariatric surgery are going to have conferences and that will offer you the opportunity to learn more. And I'd also say with bariatric surgery, having trained a lot of people with it, you got to remember that you need some good habits put in place before and after bariatric surgery to make sure it's a continued success and it's a positive thing in your life. If you don't have those good habits, um, the surgery might not uh, be as effective for you. Oh, absolutely. After two years, you will retrain the train the bowel so it's not working the way it was supposed to, and you'll lose the benefit. Uh, someone sent in a question, uh, Erica, and they'd like your web address again, so if you could uh, share that. Absolutely. My web address is uh, www.erica, E-R-I-K-A, Volk, V as in Victor, O-L-K, Fitness. Dot com. So that's ericavolkfitness.com, or you can Google the PCOS personal trainer, and sometimes I'll come up in your search results there. And maybe if it's okay with you, Dr. Perlow, maybe we'll post a resource on this Facebook feed so people can get maybe a free um, PDF or something from you. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, we'll be so glad to, to do that. And we'll keep on checking back on the feed. So if there are questions that we haven't had a chance to uh, answer today, uh, we'll be glad to either share them with Erica or I'll uh, see if I can tackle them and send them along to you. Um, so what are my thoughts about ketogenic diet? Um, I think they're great if you're willing to do them. I think most of these diets, um, they're short term and nothing is gonna be successful unless you're going to make the long term lifestyle changes. It's kind of like the metformin, gives you a kick in the pants, <laughs> but um, literally, <laughs> but unless you're actually going to make the changes, any kind of benefits are going to be short-lived. Um, there are a couple of companies out there that are selling products for ketogenic diets. Uh, one company I was surprised was actually presenting literature and the literature that they were presenting was for the other company. The company that had the, bene the beneficial results um, sorry about this. I uh, thought I had turned that off. Uh, <laughs> the company that had the beneficial results uh, sent me samples to try, and um, I think my dog ate better that week than, than I did. <laughs> the other company's stuff I liked, but uh, it wasn't their product that was being used to create the data. So I think you can try those things, and doing that along with making these changes uh, can be beneficial.
And I'd add to that, take a look at the diet. Look at the menu. Does it look like something that you could eat long term and be happy? If if you look at the ketogenic diet and it, it looks like something that you would easily adapt to, that might be a good choice for you. But there's a whole spectrum of, of diets out there and ways to manage uh, nutritional protocols to manage PCOS. There's no any one thing. So sometimes it's a lot about finding what you can do long term. And mm. I've found, at least personally. Well, I, I agree entirely. If you're not going to do it, and if it tastes like cardboard, that's not uh, where you should be going with this. Right. Um, let's see here. I think we have another question coming in about folic acid when trying to conceive. And I think anybody should uh, be on folic acid when trying to conceive. I think the um, uh, most of the prenatal vitamins is gonna, are going to have enough folic acid in it. Um, I'm not convinced that even if you do a regular old-fashioned folic acid versus the methyl tetrahydrofolic reductase uh, uh, prenatals, that there's any advantage to one prenatal over another. Um, there is a concern about vitamin B12 with long-term um, use of a uh, metformin. So that's something we look into before putting someone on um, metformin and fo following on that. But I think anybody needs to be on the folic acid. And one of the concerns about folic acid is people get pregnant, they go to their doc, and I'll, I'll wait, my doc will give me a prenatal vitamin. Mm -hmm. By the time you're pregnant, the benefit of folic acid in reducing birth defects is already passed. So oh, wow. the time to be on folic acid to protect, protect against neural tube defect is before you're pregnant, probably at least two to three months before um, to get a good response. Well, I can see how a lot of people would miss that. That's important. Um, so someone said, uh, sent in a question, what is the best way to regain regular periods? And I think we've kind of talked about that in that it's diet, exercise, and um, insulin sensitizers. And one study that was done actually locally here in Georgia uh, noted that by six months, 85% of people who did this kind of stuff had regular menstrual cycles, 85%. And then of those who got cycles, um, actually in the whole population, 65% who wanted to get pregnant got pregnant just by doing diet, exercise, and insulin sensitizers. I like my patients to use a basal body temperature track, uh, charting to track ovulation. It's free. Doing the urine test kits uh, can drive you crazy and cost a lot of money, particularly with PCOS, when at first you're not going to be ovulating. So um, just do the BBT charts. Don't worry about where they are. You can't look at a BBT chart to, to determine when to have sex, but you can see afterwards if you had sex at the right time and if you ovulated, uh, we ask our patients if they have questions to email in the basal body temperature charts, and uh, we can go from there. Um, so we'll take one more question here, and this one is about letrozole versus Clomid. And I haven't used Clomid in my practice for probably more than five years now. And um, turns out that Recent studies looking at a PCOS population show that the pregnancy rates are much better with letrozole. Clomid is going to thicken cervical mucus so fewer sperm get through. It's an anti-estrogen, so it will interfere with the uterine lining. And the Clomid can hang around for six to eight weeks after you take it. So if you do back-to-back -back cycles of Clomid, each cycle you're going to find more and more Clomid in the body and more and more adverse effect on the uterine lining. Many of the women who've been on Clomid for a couple of months come in with big ovarian cysts because mm -hmm. it hasn't cleared before they do the next cycle, and their docs weren't monitoring at the start of the cycle. Uh, with letrozole, it either works or it doesn't. I believe that 5 milligrams is the appropriate dose for everybody. If it doesn't work, then we may need to combine the letrozole with injectables. But before I'm going to start either Clomid or, or letrozole, I want to make sure that we've Normalize male hormone levels if they're still up, implantation may be down. If your C-reactive protein is up, that may interfere with development of blood vessels in the placenta. So it's really about looking at what are the metabolic abnormalities and how can we address them first. And then if you're still not pregnant, 
um, letrozole is a great tool to help restore ovulation for a majority of people. Anyway, uh, I'm going to... I have one more oh, question okay, before on. we go. Yeah. I get this question a lot, Dr. Pearl, and I hope you help, can help me answer it. Um, a lot of women contact me concerned that because their testosterone is high, when they start strength training, that it'll either make their testosterone higher or they'll develop a, kind of like an Arnold Schwarzenegger physique because they have all this testosterone coursing through their veins. Can you tell me, um, is that something we should, can be concerned about? Can you explain a little bit? Well, do I look like Schwarzenegger here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the people that you see with those kind of bodies are spending four to six hours a day and have some genetic propensity to that. Uh, the testosterone may help you preserve muscle that um, is going to be important to help you lose weight. So it's rare that someone who starts working out is going to gain weight. Certainly in the long run, the more muscle they put on, the more weight they will lose. So it's really over a period of time, it's going to be swapping fat for muscle. And with uh, 45 minutes twice a week, uh, Schwarzenegger can do the movies and <laughs> we can do the rest of the stuff. I'm not worried about looking like him or developing an accent. Well, it you sounds know? like then a little bit of higher testosterone might make you uh, better equipped to uh, train in the gym as a woman. And uh, at, at first, yes. At first, at that's first cool. yeah, so that's good. So um, we've been doing these uh, Facebook Live events uh, once a month now. Someplace on the bottom of your screen, you should see something that allows you to subscribe. We're not going to harass you with emails, but we'll let you know when the next event is up. Um, if you are uh, friending us or interested in this talk and you find it valuable, please share the presentation on your wall with other people. Do we have a next one scheduled? The Jewish Fertility Foundation. Uh, we're going to be meeting day. with the Jewish Fertility Foundation and looking at some of the uh, unique factors that Jewish women may consider. And while it's not, while there are some interesting religious concerns, those uh, factors in taking into account religion and ethnic backgrounds are important, no matter what your background is. And those are the kinds of things we'll take into account on that discussion. Stay posted or check out our uh, GRS IBF uh, Facebook page, and we'll have information there for you. So thanks. Thank you.